thank you very much for your, for your patience. So first of all, thank you Ulf and uh, the organizers of this event for the invitation. Um, and uh, maybe a special thank you also to OVAM for their um, support um, in uh, the research on urban metabolism that's been going on in Flanders, because I think it's really unique how this agency is uh, heavily involved in uh, research by design and um, other research in, in urban metabolism. Um, so maybe um, a little uh, explanation more about uh, where my passion for urban metabolism or designing with flows uh, started. As uh, Olf uh, briefly uh, said, uh, five years ago, I had the opportunity to study urban design at uh, Columbia University in New York, um, and then afterwards work at uh, a landscape architecture of Escape Studio, uh, where I was really, um, in, in, um, let's say, introduced and um, inspired um, and initiated in the systemic design, systemic thinking, and really considering landscape as uh, infrastructure. Um, at the same time when I was there, there was also the uh, unfortunate event of the Hurricane Sandy. Um, but actually for designers afterwards, it was quite uh, an interesting time uh, with initiatives such as Rebuild by Design, where really um, the, the rebuilding efforts, etc., cetera, were um, led by uh, urban designers and landscape architecture firms. Um, so really bridging um, these uh, local communities that had uh, experienced the, the damages of the hurricane with um, experts, hy hydraulics, uh, engineers, um, and regional issues such as uh, flooding, etc. So um, when I came back in 2014, I joined uh, the University of Leuven and started my PhD research on um, the spatial dimension of the circular economy. Um, okay, so today I will um, talk about a couple of things. So first, I will briefly reflect on what we discussed in the first master class. Um, then we look at urban metabolism from an urbanism perspective, uh, to then go to the case study, one of the two case studies in my research, transition in central Limburg to the circular economy. First, a look at the past and present, uh, before going into two uh, projects uh, we developed, um, in, so future projections, and then I want to share some thoughts or, or conclusions in the end. Um, okay, so to make a bridge to the first uh, master class, um, the main question that I was left with that I found in my notes on this masterclass, and I, I believe it was also um, um, expressed by the audience, was really um, what are we actually designing? Yeah, because we had been talking a lot about new business models, products made of re out of reused materials such as windmills, etc., technological innovations. But what uh, about our daily physical environments, about our landscapes, our cities, and our infrastructures? When uh, we will change uh, the way material flows circulate through our territories, our physical environments will inevitably also dramatically transform. So how we can guide this change um, and what role uh, can urbanists play in it, that is really the main question I have in, in this research and what I want to reflect on today. So as stated in a recently published new landscape declaration, um, they say across borders and beyond walls, from city centers to the last wilderness, humanity's common ground is the landscape itself. Food, water, oxygen, everything that sustains us comes from, from and returns to the landscape. So from an urbanism perspective, the topic of urban metabolism essentially comes down to how resource use and urbanization are interdependent. So when you look at this image from a 17th century Flemish landscape, you can really see that settlement was very closely linked to the, uh, to the landscape the and the natural resources it depended on. So you have the water uh, that um, is used for, for the daily activities, etc. You have the wood coming from the forest uh, used for production, but also for building shacks, etc. So both humans as well as uh, animals um, are really um, interdependent with the way they occupy uh, in the, the, the land and uh, they create their settlements. But what is left today of this clear and very direct dependency on, uh, on resources and on the landscape? I would say not much, and I, I think we all agree that today we barely know where the water we have running from our tap or the electricity we use is actually really coming from, which land or which landscape it is coming from. So we are served by decentralized uh, networks of electricity and water, which really distance uh, man from its so-called hinterland, both physically as well as uh, mentally. 
So today we see a renewed urgency um, to understand uh, the dependency between resources and urbanization. So in other words, we want to understand how flows of water, energy, uh, materials go in and out of these urbanized areas. And so uh, with resource scarcity ahead of us, several European um, and Flemish and other programs, policy programs, advocate for a more conscious use and reuse of materials, um, translating it in concepts such as circular economy, renewable energy, etc. So for example, Vision 2050, uh, which was launched uh, last year, um, lists, I believe, seven transition priorities for uh, Flanders by 2050. Um, and OVAM already, I believe, since 2012, they um, changed their um, policy from waste management, because they're actually the Flemish Waste Agency, into sustainable materials management. So really kick-starting this, uh, in the, uh, this uh, circular economy um, transition. So at first sight, these questions um, of transition, they may seem very technical, but essentially they come down to the study of and the understanding of how urbanization depends on resources today in order to redesign how tomorrow they will um, circulate in, in a circular uh, or cyclic way. So the case study I want to talk to you about today is Central Limburg. And um, you can see in the square where, where it is uh, located in northeast of, of uh, Flanders in Belgium. Um, and after the closure of Fort Henk, which um, was one of the region's main employers, um, having more than 10,000 uh, um, jobs, uh, basically. So it closed uh, last year. And um, because of this economic decline, the region is reinventing itself as a region for circular economy. Yeah? So, um, which really makes it also a great region for uh, research and, and innovation in, uh, in everything related to circular economy and, and urban metabolism. So on one hand, the Flemish government launched the SALC, which is an economic revitalization program. But what's really interesting that at the same time, a spatial question was connected to it, which is the Top Limburg uh, program. And Top Limburg investigates the transition to circular economy and circular development as a driver for spatial development. Yeah, so this is where circular economy becomes then also a, a spatial question. So you could say that circular development um, would be the spatial component of the circular economy, and it refers to a society where ecology is not disconnected from economic and sociocultural uh, development. In a way, actually, uh, central Limburg has always been a resource region. In pre-industrial times, as shown on this picture, settlements were anchored on locally available resources, which were water, peat, and ores. And uh, the pits that were dug for peat, so turf uh, for <laughs> the Flemish-speaking people, um, were uh, then afterwards used as fishing ponds in a sophisticated system of irrigation uh, connected to the Demer River side branches. So to show it on a more um, regional image, maybe I start using the pointer because yes. okay <laughs> okay um, so uh, yes yeah, so these ponds eh, that's, those are these little um, white dots that you can see uh, are, are those things where, the, where they were digging the peat and then afterwards they were ponds that were reused in fishing, fish farming, etc. So in this era of bio-based economies that were directly coming from the landscape, resource extraction and urban form or urban patterns were closely linked. Resource extraction really being the direct driver of the urbanization uh, that you can see on the map of, in the right. So all the black lines are the, the developments, so the houses and the, the settlements. And when you look at the abstracted image, you can uh, identify that it's really the landscape structure, so the, the topography, the, the Campine Plateau, and then the river branches that are structuring the urbanization. So economic activity was very strongly tied to the land, um, and, uh, and that's very visible there. But things dramatically changed when coal was discovered in the underground around 1900. Um, and with the coal extraction age in the first half of the 20th century, the scale of infrastructure and landscape manipulation made a huge uh, jump. 
compared to the bio-based economies. Here you can see a picture of a mining site in Houthalen Helchteren uh, with the shaft towers and the slag heap of uh, residual material coming from the, the coal extraction. And then on the, the map, uh, the regional, the more regional map, you can see that large-scale infrastructures were put in place to extract coal and efficiently transport it to the industrial centers of uh, Antwerp and Liège. So there is the coal track, which is a, a railway track. And then there are the seven mining sites. And uh, the railway track would connect to the Albert Canal. And through the Albert Canal, the coal was transported to Liège and Antwerp. Um, also, the landscape dramatically transformed because there were um, pine forests planted everywhere, so they were not native vegetation, to support exactly this extraction activity, this mining activity. So urbanization came in the form of remarkable mining cities, as we know them, little villages close to the mine with housing, schools, etc., for works, and they had a completely different shape than the lines we saw on the, on the previous image. So there were these uh, more uh, clustered um, developments, really... Um, in close proximity to these mining infrastructures. So then with um, the closure of the mines in the second half of the 20th century, heavy industries were attracted eh, to provide work for all these people who lost their jobs with the uh, closing of the mines. Um, and Ford Manufacturing came to the region, uh, providing work also on a regional, regional level. Um, so these industries were mainly supported by uh, car infrastructure, even though Fort Henk was really um, in the in the really close proximity to the canal and deserved by rail. But uh, at that time, really, it was car infrastructure that uh, was, was leading urbanization and not just urbanization, because you can see with a car, everything is uh, accessible. So it just starts spreading out, which gives us the typical Flemish nebulous urban urbanization condition of houses everywhere, allotments, etc. But also the industrial terrains, eh, they were really scattered over the region and always connected to the abundantly available car infrastructure. So central Limburg's regenerative resource landscape supported multiple socio-ecological changes, leaving important traces in the landscape. So first fishing ponds, then mining terrains, mining villages, the large-scale canal, etc. And in each of these um, resource instances, so from bio over co coal to actually oil, eh, which was then imported, not available um, in, in Limburg, but driving car-related um, uh, development, there was also a paradigm shift each time in ways to inhabit and urbanize the territory. However, in the last phase, the urbanization really has nothing to do with locally available resources or land, eh, because uh, we, we barely see anything left from, from the original landscape, uh, landscape drivers. So this brings us to the question of what's next. Eh? If this is how, how it happened in the past, this interplay between the resources, the landscape, and the urbanization, um, how will the dependency between urbanization or production and resources take shape in the so-called post-oil era driven by a circular economy? So how can this transition reconnect urbanization and production with, it with its landscape and resources and lead to more sustainable urbanization patterns that are more in sync with natural metabolisms. So from uh, this, the historical resource mappings that I showed you and Vision 2050, we, we understood that we should scan the territory as it is today for renewable resources that are already there but that today are unnoticed, they're underused, they are, they're untapped, uh, in order to be able to redefine a more local dependency between urbanization and the resources in its uh, surroundings. So this brings us to the questions, what are really these locally available renewable resources? And actually in central Limburg, there are many, many um, resource flows that are currently consisted to be waste or economically having no value, but that are definitely there. And so this is what is shown on the maps. We, uh, we have been uh, mapping uh, through uh, well, different types of, of resources. So you could say there's some kind of state of the art of these uh, untapped or unused uh, materials and energy resources in, in the region. Maybe to, to show you a few of them in, in detail. So the most obvious ones are um, the waste practices uh, that are, are already existing and are mapped here that are dealing with recycling, repairing, uh, converting of waste. Because these recyclers of today, they will be the material providers in the circular economy. 
Um, in the area, a lot of effort and subsidies, etc., are going also to innovation and research and circular economy. You see multiple hubs uh, of, of those. Um, and uh, one um, waste flow that has been identified as, as quite uh, interesting for central Limburg is biomass from uh, landscape waste. Because one characteristic of central Limburg is really its, uh, its uh, landscapes, its extended landscapes. And these are maintained, um, but for the moment, what comes out of this maintenance, so the piles of uh, grasses and branches, etc., are underused. Nothing has been done with it. But it has been uh, the subject of many studies and uh, quant quantifying, uh, which I will show you later. But besides material flows, also space itself eh, can be a wasted resource. And so here in the top uh, map, we also looked at uh, the region's oversized or abandoned infrastructure, such as the coal track, eh, which used to connect the mining sites, but is today, for the largest part, completely underused. Or the Albert Canal that has been really overdimensioned, has a lot of capacity that is not being used, uh, whereas on the roads we are dealing a lot with traffic congestion. Um, and then on the, the, the top, uh, the bottom map shows that actually the landscape itself has been recycled many times over and over again. Uh, for example, the terrill I showed you on the, on the image of Houthalen has today been flattened uh, in order to superimpose it with an industrial, um, industrial platform. Um, or many of the sand and gravel extraction sites have been repurposed as recreational lakes, etc. So recycling is really uh, in these types of mappings being broadened uh, to um, many other interpretations and purely uh, waste, uh, waste recycling. In terms of energy, there are quite some energy sources available that are currently not being used. Um, let's talk about the, the bottom map. Central Limburg is a region, is, is um, one region in, in the campaign that is uh, high potential for geothermal energy. So there's a lot of um, research going on uh, in there. And Top Limburg also investigated the option to use, to repurpose the coal track as a carrier for a heat network that is fueled by this uh, deep geothermal energy, um, which in, es is in essence is deep geothermal energy is also heat that is coming, ev evaporating from uh, the soil, but uh, is currently is not being re recovered. But so it's, in way wasted, eh? but uh, could be repurposed uh, or redirected in geothermal energy um, networks. Also wind energy and the biomass I, I uh, spoke about. Um, so a bit as, a, as an introduction and a background eh, of the analysis and the, we conducted in, uh, in Central Limburg uh, before uh, going into project mode, a uh, projective mode, so uh, how could this then translate into future scenarios. Um, and uh, I want to show you two uh, design explorations. The first one is in uh, Houthalen Helchtere, um, where actually Houthalen Helchtere, so there we did a few urban design studios with master students in urbanism, but also an intensive workshop with um, 20 young professionals, landscape architects, architects, urbanists, um, and uh, we worked in close col collaboration with um, the municipality and local experts to generate uh, some ideas. And um, so together with uh, Ruimte Vlaanderen as well and, and uh, the municipality, we uh, looked at this question of how can this transition to the circular economy be more than just a, a technical uh, question. Because in uh, Houtal Helgter, we have quite a few pioneer projects that are uh, widely known on um, circular economy techniques, which one of them is the Remo landfill. And this is one of the three remaining active landfills in Flanders. And there uh, they do this enhanced landf landfill mining, which uh, is a technique where they dig up back the waste from the 60s and the 70s, that's their underground. And they um, uh, transform it into building materials or hydrogen. The installation you see there is the the hydrogen, uh, the, the water uh, that they recover from the waste that they then purify and reuse on the site, etc. So quite impressive uh, initiative. Another one is uh, Greenville, and this is in the former mining administration building uh, that uh, they have now a, a clean technology incubator, which supports clean technology startups. 
Um, and for example, one, one thing that has been developed there is the billy bin, which is uh, an exploration of uh, an alternative composting technique. So these clean tech initiatives, they can be very low tech uh, or high tech, but uh, this is full of startups that are supported um, in uh, various ways. So on the top image, you can see uh, these two initiatives. The Remo landfill is, is over here. This is a portion of the coal track and then the clean tech campus near the uh, industrial site. And as you can see on that image, the current uh, circular economy initiatives, they are spatially quite isolated and as I, sh I showed you, pretty technocratic, you could say. Um, so from the idea that designing with flows essentially goes back to understanding resource flows in the landscape, we uh, took a look during this workshop and, and the, the preparatory research at the regional landscapes. And uh, we learned that the region's landscape really houses quite a few waste flows as well, such as biomass, uh, water from the mining subsidence areas, and deep geothermal energy. And I want to go more in detail in, in one of those um, to show you our methodology. Um, and this is the biomass from uh, landscape waste. Yeah, so the map on the right is uh, produced by a MIP2 study of the Flemish government, and it shows basically in the, in the green um, squares where the potential to recover biomass from landscape management waste is high. Yeah? So Houtal Helchter is in this red circle and really has uh, quite some biomass surrounding it. Um, so they understood this very well, and together with the regional landscape low campaign, um, they have started a project of a biomass hub in uh, Europark, which is another industrial site in Houthalen, where they will collect the biomass from landscape waste from in a radius of 20 kilometers. So how does this work? Because when I first heard about a biomass hub, I wasn't completely sure what, what, what it exactly is. So it is uh, a place where the biomass from all the different types of landscapes is collected and then sorted and uh, packaged to then sell as a raw material for bio-industries or wood manufacturing uh, 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 food for, uh, for animals, etc. So nothing is really produced there, but the core is that the material is brought together in sufficient quantities that it makes it economically interesting to then uh, resell as a raw material. And so uh, the four different types of landscapes, they necessitate different types of maintenance, they have different growth cycles, etc. And all of that we, uh, we got into in detail with uh, experts on, on these landscapes. So what is really needed in the area if, of uh, central Limburg to, to deal with this biomass idea is a management tool to collect and connect all of this biomass from landscape management. Um, so the regional landscape low campaign, they developed or they are developing such an app uh, in which they really um, enable land users or themselves to do input uh, where there are the different types of landscapes when they are maintained. So at each time in real time, they have an overview of this uh, residual waste flow uh, that they can then start uh, valorizing in the biomass hub. So with all of this um, input and, 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 uh, and knowledge that we gained uh, during this workshop, we asked ourselves, okay, so how does this then translate to um, design it on the ground? So we did uh, a design exploration um, of a buffer zone in, uh, next to uh, the industrial area. So this is actually the industry terrain that is on top of the flattened uh, mining terrain. And this is a buffer zone that, um, as in Flanders with all industrial areas, is there because of uh, land use regulations. They require a natural buffer zone uh, bordering each industrial area. So it's from the 1970s, but today we understood from, um, from the municipality there is quite some development pressure of this uh, buffer zone. So there was a big box developer that wants to put a store in here because it is very close to the Grote Baan, which is very highly accessible. So we said, okay, let's think of a redevelopment frame departing from ideas from, uh, from integrated landscape uh, development. So we looked at how this buffer zone looked, it, or this area that's now the buffer zone, looked in uh, the 18th century. And you can see here that it already had some um, hedgerows which were delineating uh, the land. And today when you go in the buffer zone, you still, still see remnants of, uh, of these uh, century-old trees which quite, have quite some uh, 
some uh, yeah, historical value, let's say. And uh, an ecologist uh, also learned that uh, there's quite some valuable biodiversity, etc., in this buffer zone. So in this design exploration, we um, suggested a phased redevelopment integrating water management with uh, ecological and cultural values as a frame for development of extra program. So you can see that in the first uh, one, the hedgerow remnants are identified and, and uh, re reinforced, uh, restored, um, while at the same time, um, there, is a, there is a strategy for water um, buffering for water coming from this uh, industrial platform that is in fact 12 meters higher, but has problems of erosion of the edge when uh, in case of heavy rainfall. Um, so this can be um, integrated as well. Uh, with then also introduction of um, biomass crops eh, on, the, on the cleared land uh, to include in the biomass cycle, and to then um, at the same time create public accessibility from the industrial platform that currently has no outdoor space for the people who work there at all. And then eventually eh, it provides a landscape frame where development can um, happen um, in an integrated way. So doing more than just uh, developing it, but at the same time dealing with other um, problems or, uh, or challenges of, of the platform and the area. So it is this transformation that you see on this image that also follows the same phasing and what starts with collecting uh, in a very technical way the water from the platform, directing it in pipes to the buffer zone that's lower. Uh, it then transforms into a public accessible, accessible uh, platform while the productive landscape is activated and eventually it really um, combines uh, the development with all these other things. And so the, the map on top shows that dealing with this, really thinking of landscape as infrastructure, really structuring the development, it can, so the buffer zone is here, yeah, but applying the same thinking, the same design thinking to the other landscapes, um, gradually the uh, landscape becomes activated as an infrastructure dealing with these different challenges and flows at uh, the same time. So um, the next study I want to talk about, the, the second one and last one, is uh, Atelier Track Design. Um, and this was a study that was commissioned by the OVAM uh, in Ruimte Vlaanderen. In, uh, and I was part of it from, uh, my research, uh, from, as a researcher, and it was uh, led by Wit Architecte and in collaboration with Lateral Thinking Factory and uh, Technum. And so it was really launched as an uh, out-of-the-box design experiment asking how to develop or redevelop this former industrial site as a hub for a regional circular economy, so departing from this idea of designing with, with flows. The original goal of the study was um, to inspire and inform the ongoing redevelopment process um, the master plan, keeping as much as possible the door open for an innovative redevelopment of a circular economy. So this is the, the fourth site the, the, that was, that was um, abandoned uh, about a year ago. So very early in uh, the process, we understood from the agencies um, that are responsible for the redevelopment of the site that one of their biggest concerns is time. They wanted to be able to provi provide jobs as soon as possible, and the way they wanted to do this, or want to do this, is by dividing the site into plots and then develop them as soon as possible uh, with innovative circular um, industries. But we thought if we really want Fort Yang, this site, to become a pioneer in circular economy, um, we really need time and space for experiments. It's been, been said in the last masterclass as well and in many gatherings on, on this topic. In order to really define and understand how this circular um, development could really take shape. So that is why in this study we really put a lot of emphasis on an alternative uh, redevelopment process which precisely creates um, space for time and uh, this is done through three um, development phases. So first, uh, so activation, incubation, and circulation. So first, 
Yes, so in the activation phase, um, we proposed to really um, make clear to the world that on this site there will be the center of this new industry 4.0. And how to do that? Yeah, so for example, with a big event, um, the Circular Flanders event, we called it Gathering State of the Art Techniques and Initiatives Around Circular Economy. You could compare it to um, what happened in Flanders Expo in the, in the 80s, eh, where uh, these Flanders technology fairs were organized every two years um, to also um, catalyze the third industrial revolution. Eh? So there is really need, if we're talking about this fourth industrial revolution, to do something similar that can then at the same time become a vehicle to create knowledge and dynamic around, uh, around this transition. So at the same time of um, having these types of, of events, we uh, can start to prepare the site physically eh, for this new occupation because there are quite some issues of soil sanitation, demolition, reconstruction, but all of these things also, they could be rethought in circular ways. Oh, that's the, what, we, what we proposed. And so this phase, the activation phase, would then seed um, the plant, the seeds, for an alternative organization and a way of um, attracting and developing new industries. So then in the second phase, the incubation phase, um, the circular economy businesses and industries start uh, taking um, a more permanent position on the site and um, start experimenting in the exchange of resource flows eh? because this is also something we have a lot of learning to do in eh? to what, what can be exchanged and how can it be exchanged, what are the technical requirements, etc. So the only way to really project on this is to provide um, a space to learn about this. And then all of these changes then result in a, in a circular, circular phase, the last phase, circulation phase, which then uh, makes the site really uh, circular and um, also has a circular hub in, in its region. So basically the proposal envisions this circular redevelopment on all levels, terrain preparation, phasing, the planning of events, and I will give just a few uh, of the examples, but we have uh, fresh of the press the the report uh, over there, if you want one, you can take one when you uh, late, uh, later. Um, so one example is the uh, circular terrain preparation. On the site, there is quite some industrial pollution of, uh, of the soil. Eh? So there is the Batex pollution, which is more oil. Then there are, heavy, there are metal pollution along the, the railway. And um, on the site, experiments have been conducted uh, with phytoremediation. So this is when plants are used to clean the soil. And they were actually successful, but they require uh, a lot of time. So this is what we drew in, uh, in this section. And so poplars were planted um, here on the site. This is a plan. And actually, the, the groundwater is going from here to there, so underground, and taking this pollution with it outside of, of the site. But since the planting of the poplars in 1999, um, so the roots injected with bacteria, they absorb this pollution. And this technique has prevented the pollution to uh, go beyond the site edges. So, so this has, has been working. And also, year by year, of course, the total pollution becomes less and less. But it is such an enormous pollution that it would take really more, many more decades to clean it entirely uh, like that. But we said, okay, why not? Because the site is so big, and why not uh, see this also as a pioneering project in these types of, uh, of techniques? So on the right image, you can see um, along the railway, Schildkraut, which is uh, then a planting um, that can um, extract uh, the metal pollution from, from the soil. And, and we, we developed this with an expert who, who knew very well the type of pollution and, and the site. Um, but at the same time, it really becomes uh, also a frame, a landscape frame on the site. Eh? So it can be, uh, be integrated in the site's spatial landscape uh, and perform other ecosystem services such as water buffering, uh, while at the same time providing um, an experimental educational landscape that also creates jobs because you need people to, to maintain this and to monitor this, etc. Um, and to, that really becomes a pioneer in this alternative circular soil uh, cleaning techniques. So then, um, in addition to that, so here you see on the map, you see the, the poplars, and then um, 
the the the, the Betix plume is here. So this is this is this uh, this area. Um, but in addition to that, um, the landscape uh, plantations are expanded with short rotation wood crops on the vacant lots. So those are these. And so this concept is already applied on vacant industrial lots in uh, West Flanders, giving the lots a temporary economic value while waiting for a development. So next to the fort site, there is Norbors wood processing. So it makes perfect sense eh, to um, do this type of things while we're waiting anyway for uh, new companies to, uh, to come and, uh, and install themselves there. And at the same time, um, at the same time, um, create the landscape of uh, the site itself. So rainwater is buffered on site and uh, can then be evacuated to the Kaasbeek, which is there. And this is then a major uh, infrastructure in, in that green, green water buffering structure. So the emphasis in this circular um, redevelopment is to introduce an economy that is really closely intertwined with the landscape itself as a, a renewable natural resource. So besides um, transformations uh, of the site edges into multifunctional infrastructures, which I will show you on the next slide, uh, we propose also a new infrastructural access centrally on the site. So you can see it on the right image. It is cutting through what is now an existing hull, uh, which is transformed. Um, and this infrastructure goes throughout the whole site and takes different shapes. It's a combination of hard infrastructures as it is here, so pipes, etc and soft infrastructure where it becomes more the, the landscape I was talking about earlier. And you can see it really on this image as a, a, a bundle of pipes attached to the roof structure or below ground, um, where easily material flows can be added or removed uh, when, as needed. And then in the section you can see that um, excess heat, which is uh, in studies we received abundantly available from the industry surrounding, could also be redirected and generate programs such as greenhouses, et cetera, um, really making use of this uh, resource that is, that is available anyway. So again here, what is important before um, being able to define which pipes and which structures are really needed, because in a way that's really the, answers, the answer that they wanted uh, in this study, uh, or at least that uh, the redevelopers wanted very hands-on, but in order to know this, you really need this activation and incubation uh, phases as a time of learning and defining what is really uh, needed. So what we focused on was really the infrastructural um, principles and, uh, and, and framework. So on this image of uh, the circulation phase on, on, uh, on the left, uh, you can see that the infrastructural framework I'm talking about really consists of a combination of landscape structures um, which are performative uh, and hard edges uh, such as um, a reworked uh, canal uh, edge with, with platforms, etc., and then the reactivated railway which with side branches on the site. Um, and so basically it is um, shown, it is, what is drawn is a possible occupation with new um, industries that we don't know yet. Uh, um, but um, all the new companies have access to both rail and water, which we thought was really important when thinking of the way mobility changes and uh, uh, the, the great uh, advantage that these sites can make of, uh, of the canal and the rail. So on the right, you can see then a sort of scan of the site's metabolism that uh, could be directed through this infrastructural frame. So both consisting of industrial flows, but also um, practical flows of water management of the site, etc. So regionally, uh, here we have the, the site back in, in the region here on this image. What happens on the, sli on the site uh, slowly starts connecting to other initiatives uh, and infrastructures in the region. Um, so starting, for example, with this big event on the site to really make it known, you could activate the unactivated uh, railway from the center of Genk and bring people to the site um, through the rail or even with boats through the canal, etc. because currently it is very inaccessible any other way than, than by car. And um, so the, 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 and the soil sanitation can take place on the site or in collaboration with soil um, cleaning processors um, along the canal, so only using the canal as well um, and not adding extra transport on the, the road. Water management is inscribed into the regional logic 
uh, and the fourth site so becomes part of, of the ecological regional uh, system. And so conceptually, yeah, in the circulation phase, this would mean a gradual integration and reactivation of the regional infrastructure, so the coal track, uh, which is going through the site as well, um, the canal, and, um, and the regional green and water structures connecting uh, Fort Gang to uh, other hubs of activities uh, and uh, resource regions. So for the purpose of this presentation, um, I wanted to talk about one of the outcomes of uh, Atelier Track Design, which was really, um, well, our goal was really to um, make some of the, of the goals of Vision 2050 a bit more concrete through this design uh, exploration. So I quote from Vision 2050, says, Vision 2050 calls for a fundamental culture shift within the Flemish government, an evolution to a culture of collaboration and courage to choose for innovation and experimentation, a culture of questioning our own regulations. And so in Atelier Track Design, the brief, there was talk about, for example, um, regelluwe zones, which are zones um, without any policy or uh, regulatory uh, requirements. Um, but we wanted to really take it a step further um, and think of, okay, if we need new policies, um, what, what can they then really be? What is wrong with the existing policies and prevents us from, from really doing this? Um, and so from studying other industrial terrains, such as the one in Houtala, we understood some interesting things. For example, uh, Bionerga, a waste incinerator um, on uh, Centrum Zuid, produces uh, four megawatts of hot steam, which it then directly sells to Aquafin, which is uh, their neighbor and which uses this steam to dry sludge collected from the entire region. Um, but it also produces five megawatts electricity and it cannot really um, sell it to their neighbors because of uh, regulations. So for the steam, they can just put a pipe under the road and sell it to their neighbor. But for electricity, uh, there is a monopoly or, a, or an agreement, or I don't know how to call it, by Elia who uh, has... Uh, well, the, all excess electricity has to go into their grid and then be redistributed. Yes? So it is not as simple as just connecting your residual flows to your neighbors. There are really some policy changes uh, needed in order to be able to do that. Also, the way our industry terrains are today developed, uh, mainly uh, industry terrains, they are um, a set of um, plots. And the uh, industries that come there, they buy a plot, they get their building permit, and then it is very fixed. So it doesn't really allow afterwards to go for interesting uh, flow exchanges between, um, between neighbors because the permitting system uh, doesn't allow for this. So there are concepts such as kadervergunningen, um, um, more collective um, uh, policy uh, frameworks. Uh, Professor Allard from UGENS has been developing some of those, which could uh, really help in making also the, the policy framework um, uh, yeah, being able to accommodate for this type of, of development. All right, so this brings me to, um, well, some, some thoughts or conclusions, um, if, if we can call it conclusions, on designing with flows. Um, so, if we want uh, designing with flows to um, become drivers for sustainable spatial development, we really need to analyze the territories of intervention across scales. I think it was very clear also from the, the previous presentation. Um, and as we did in the case of Central Limburg, we mapped the residual flows of water, waste, energy and people really as a state of the art of these flows, but not necessarily quantitatively, but really with the emphasis, emphasis of how they are rooted in space. And so then being aware of um, this bigger regional picture of, uh, of the flows and how they are rooted in space forms the basis for so-called systemic design, uh, a term that was developed by uh, landscape architect Alan Berger, uh, saying that a combination of local realities uh, and conditions and regional flows together, they uh, for, forge together, make intelligent uh, landscapes. So, secondly, transition requires complex systems changes on multiple levels, and eventually these changes translate to space. But um, designing with flows is really much, much more than a spatial question. So it requires an understanding of uh, 
actors, so who owns the flow, how is the flow distributed, etc. Policy, how uh, can the flow be redirected if we have it? Uh, development processes, so how are different actors um, that have an impact on these flows now collaborating or not? And so these are the types of things we try to understand in these types of diagrams um, that, uh, that we produce along with the, uh, the, the design proposals. And so as um, shown in the first point uh, of the conclusion, we can analyze flows on a regional scale uh, and try to understand the complete picture uh, from source to sink, if you want. But um, how do we then start designing with flows? Eh? So which flows, for example, to start with? So in uh, the first example that I showed, the examples of biomass and water are not necessarily the most interesting ones economically, but they hold the potential to connect uh, ecological, social, economic agendas while they restructure um, space in a more sustainable way. So additionally, with the examples of uh, biomass, we found very interesting dynamics in this flow, eh? the studies that were being conducted and quantifying this. And so um, the project that had been started on the biomass hub. So we found motivated experts uh, that were willing to engage in the design process and really feed it, um, because they also saw a lot of potential in expanding their um, mission of a logistical question to a question of creating synergies with um, circular economy, ecology, and, uh, and space. So in the approach that I present, then um, urban design itself uh, becomes a mediator. So the future imaginaries that uh, I showed, um, they are not just pretty pictures. Eh? So they integrate all um, knowledge that we collect in the process from stakeholders potential flow data, potential uh, technical solutions and circular uh, business models. Um, and they translate it into a possible future spatial outcome of a circular economy that is at the same time um, ecological and, and social, creating jobs, etc. So classic tools of urbanism uh, in defining spaces and structures that guide development really urgently have to be expanded with the more intangible aspects of, uh, of transition in order to make the way that urbanization depends on resources more sustainable. And it's really these tools that in this research we want to, uh, to uh, get a grip on. So these designs or future imaginaries, they become a medium for negotiation in the so much needed multidisciplinary collaborations. Um, so at this stage, so basically for clarifying what we are dealing with uh, when we talk about uh, this transition. So designing with flows uh, necessitates new coalitions between existing stakeholders because currently uh, flows are managed in a very sectorized and untransparent way. And uh, thinking about who should talk to who to change the way flows uh, are going to be transported is crucial. So this image from Atelier Track Design, besides inventing how it could potentially look or how it, how it, yeah, how it should look, um, we also thought of, okay, this can only happen if certain uh, agencies start talking to certain experts and start organizing themselves in expert groups and really collaboratively, collaboratively start generating the knowledge that currently is not there, but uh, we are all uh, waiting for, looking for. So to really conclude now, <laughs> the three questions that were, uh, we were asked also to reflect on for this uh, presentation. Um, the biggest challenge. So one, one, of course, there were many challenges, but uh, let's say the, the biggest challenge or one of the biggest was uh, when I first started this research, of course, uh, we were very interested in mainly data-driven approaches eh, or, uh, or, or an approach such as developed by Fabric. But uh, very soon we became uh, to the conclusion that in Flanders, uh, data on resource flows is really quite um, protected or unavailable. It's very difficult to understand where, where and if it is centralized, and often it is not available um, or accessible, and uh, so it's really a big obstacle. If you see, for example, this image of, um, of Bionerga, eh, what I was talking about earlier, and then with Aquafin and the sludge, all the numbers you see, how I got, uh, got them, was literally by going there and making an appointment with the engineer that is um, 
op op managing the operational parts of these uh, industrial facilities and getting the numbers from them. Yeah, so it is really that complicated. Um, so on top of that, as we uh, discussed in the first master class, what would we do with all the data if, if we had it? Yeah? That's also an, an important uh, thing to reflect on. So the way we worked with this, or we are working with this in this re research is really to um, define an approach that does not depend on exact data from the very start, but identifies through the scenarios which detailed data is really needed, and then works from there um, onwards. So in other words, the starting point is not necessarily to intervene in the most economically or quantitatively most interesting flow, um, but the one that really has a potential to become a lever for other challenges uh, related to ecology, space, job creation, etc., and essentially define qualitative spaces. And then, of course, this is ongoing uh, research, and we were asked to talk about some results or achievements. And what I show now is, uh, of course, not a, a sole achievement of this research, but I do believe that our research trajectory um, fed it or nurtured it in, in, uh, in, in a certain way. So, as I said, we had an intense collaboration with the municipality of uh, Houthaal Helchtere. We did two design studios and then an intensive uh, design workshop, um, landscape urbanism workshop. And um, gradually, the ideas uh, that I presented now uh, started really uh, gaining um, yeah, momentum within the, the municipality. The mayor and aldermen were really seeing things that they saw as problems that they could become opportunities. And so um, we supported them also with their application for um, the pilot projects um, back in circulation, which is a collaboration between the OVAM and the Baumeister um, to uh, connect urban or to couple urban transformations, urban transition uh, to integrated soil sanitation. And because given that this industry uh, platform uh, in Houthale is on top of a, a former mining terrain, they have a very specific and weird uh, soil pollution condition there, uh, but at the same time, they really want to reconvert this industry terrain as, um, as a, an, an innovative circular um, uh, industry 4.0. So um, the application really uh, builds on, uh, on some of the concepts we co-produced with them, and uh, this project will now get the support from this, um, this uh, Pilot project three in Omloop, so it really uh, is uh, uh, yes not very nice to see how the municipality starts uh, to really see their their problems not just as technical problems but to connect uh, bigger uh, possibilities to uh, to these uh, opportunities. So to now really conclude in uh, <laughs> the, the final final one. Um, in the uh, examples that I have shared, uh, the main um, point is that the question of transition and uh, designing with flows is always uh, open to integrate other um, components, can be ecological, social, economic. Um, and one of the reasons uh, of why we are all here, um, I understand, is because designing with flows really um, requires new methods of collaboration and design. And uh, in these ways uh, of collaborating, we really experience that urban design can build bridges connecting experts, actors, and stakeholders uh, through one common language, which is our physical environment. So basically the spaces we work, live, and play in. Thank you very much for your attention.